all those exhibition only Rolexes at retailers, can you actually try those on? I just assumed that they were there to hide behind glass. No, no. That, that was the whole point that you could try them on and oh. you could register your interest or whatever. I, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I read like it, it all because there's always that like plaque next to it. And obviously watches are always behind glass. I, I always treated it as like a museum piece where it's like it's to be to be looked at and not and not touched. I think what's well, maybe it, for you. I mean, people have pictures of yeah, you. They, of. they refuse to they <laughs> refuse to acknowledge my presence. And if they do, it's only to ask me to leave the uh, the retailer. That's what a felony will do. (laughs) (laughs) I can neither confirm nor deny. (laughs) This is Open Work, a look inside the watch industry, a podcast from Collective Horology. I'm Gabe Riley, co-founder of Collective. And I'm Asher Rapkin, co-founder of Collective. Collective Horology is an independent watch retailer based in Southern California. We carry a wide range of independent brands, including Chapek, Speak Marine, Fears, and more. To learn more about us and check out our available inventory, visit collectivehorology.com. Today, we're going to share an industry perspective on what's quickly becoming something of a New York watch week, comprising the Wind Up Watch Fair, Watch Time New York, and more. Additionally, we're going to share a live podcast recording from the Wind Up Watch Fair, a joint episode between us and the Worn and Wound podcast. Podcast. It's a conversation with Martin Fry of Urwork and Jonathan Ferrer of Brew about how they built their brands. But before we get into that, let's go back to wind up, watch time, and kind of this bigger notion of a New York Watch Week and, and chat a little bit about that. I mean, this time of year in New York, October in New York, has quickly gone from being the time of year you expect one or maybe two, in this case now, watch fairs to roll around into something really of an industry tentpole, where you see brands across the spectrum showing up in New York. You've got collectors and enthusiasts, not just from the New York area, but across the US and really worldwide descending on New York. You've got these two fairs, you have a lot of things happening on the side, and you have a lot of launches and media moments that are happening as part of this week in New York. And it kind of begs the question of where is this, where is this all going? Is this becoming something more than a, kind of an informal cast of fairs, events, and uh, media moments? The United States is one of the largest watch markets in the world. We see this in every financial report that comes out from every major company. And the fact that we have seen American, Swiss, Japanese, and and German, et cetera, watch companies descending on New York at this time, you know, one of the largest cities in the country, I think is, is, is just a logical next step. This is a tentpole event, not only for these brands, but it's also, you know, the gateway to Q4. And Q4, as many people know, is when most businesses, most retail businesses certainly become profitable. So the fact that we have seen this, and you know, I'm going to remove the collector and the operational side and just look at it from a cold-hearted lizard brain, you know, business standpoint. It's an utterly critical moment because it is that opportunity to get in front of clients, enthusiasts, and collectors one more time in mass, both from a media standpoint and from a one-to-one interaction standpoint with with clients. And I think that can't be understated. The second thing is when you look at the United States and consider that there's hundreds of millions of people who live here and that we know it's one of the largest markets for watches, it's kind of shocking, actually, how few large-scale events exist within this country. Good point. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like Singapore, for example, certainly around Europe and very, you know, and in France and Italy, et cetera, there are lots of events all throughout the year. And in the United States, Really, you know, you have wind up, you have watch time. I, I think there's a new entrant, Aspen Watch Week, which is sponsored by, I believe, a, an authorized dealer out in the, in the market. And then, of course, there's Intersect, which is relatively new. But all, all thing, but that's still very small relative to what we're talking about here. And there's certainly no other event that takes on the significance or the scope of what happens in New York in October. No, not not remotely. So I, I I think you know from a purely business standpoint, there's a lot of strong rationale for it. What is if we if we take that hat off for a moment though, and look at this from the perspective of the enthusiast, it's also just an incredible opportunity because if you're interested in a two hundred dollar watch that might be found at Wind Up, all the way up to you know million dollar pieces that Grupo Forsi was exhibiting at Watch Time. You know, having the chance to actually go hands on with these pieces is really exceptional because the thing is, as I think most listeners know, 
not all boutiques have everything, right? And not all boutiques or most boutiques rarely have full lines. So the beauty of a watch show is that it does provide that unusual opportunity to be able to go and look at 12, 20, 30, 40 pieces from a particular brand and actually see the full carne and really enjoy it. This is the thing that I, I always found funny when people were complaining about all the for exhibition only Rolex watches. On the one hand, it was a bummer because you couldn't actually buy them. But on the other hand, it was unheard of to have essentially the full Rolex line available to try on. And like having that opportunity now across, you know, over 200 brands, if you combine everyone exhibiting wind up, et cetera, all together in New York for a hundred some odd hours. I mean, it's, it's really for, for an enthusiast, it is an unmissable opportunity if you can make it there. Now, I think what's interesting about the New York watch week, let's just call it that for all intents and purposes is when you mention some of those other things, when we talk about uh, another great example would be Geneva Watch Week. Obviously, watch days. Sorry, Geneva Watch Days, Watches and Wonders, these other events, Dubai Watch Week, whatever it might be, they are conceived, organized efforts. There's a level of intention behind them. The New York thing is very organic and happened grassroots. I don't think that and I could be wrong, but I don't think that when Watch Time started Watch Time New York or Wind Up started Wind Up New York, there was a notion that this time in New York would sort of eclipse those two events individually and become something bigger. And it's a testament, I think, to your point, to the strength of the New York market that without anyone coming in and saying, this is New York Watch Week, we effectively now have a New York Watch Week. And I think there's a couple of things going on in the industry that help get us there. One is you're absolutely right. The US is not only the largest watch market, and it isn't always, but it's consistently the largest watch market. It is critical to the business of of all the brands who are there in the watch industry overall. And we know that when we go to any trade show or we meet directly with any brand, particularly when we talk to brands for the first time, so when we're having an initial conversation with a brand about retail or a project together, we consistently hear that the U.S. is their biggest market and their most important market. The other thing is, right now, the Chinese market is suffering. And if you look at global watch sales, and we've talked about the fact that overall on a global level, watch sales have been down year over year as of you know the last time these things were, were reported, the driver of that or the fundamental driver of that is really China. The luxury industry is obviously very dependent on China, and the Chinese economy is going through some some tough times right now. There's a, a bunch of central bank and fiscal policy that's happening in China to try to address that and stimulate their economy and stimulate spending. So we'll see where that goes. But those two facts, along with the fact that there is no organized effort, I think, put some wind behind the sails of this New York Watch Week. And, and, it, and, I, and ironically, leads it to be, or maybe not ironically, but leads it to be one of the most important watch events that happens all year without any central organizing, which I think is quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, it's, it is bizarre that no one has stepped in who's a local New York retailer or, well, who's a local New York retailer to really like stick a, a proverbial flag in the ground and, and attempt to really organize all of this. You know, Wempe, for example, has been a long time uh, presenting sponsor of Watch Time, but it, their, their influence doesn't extend beyond that. And I think the opportunity for any of the local retailers, you know, be it um, small, you know, small independents or, or large conglomerates is, is significant. The other thing I find fascinating about, about this period in New York is relative to the other shows that you and I go to, the Geneva Watch Days, Watches and Wonders, et cetera. It's not that there isn't business being done there, but it's extremely, extremely small percentage of the time spent compared to those other shows. The majority of the time that you and I spend, for example, at in Geneva, when we go to those two different shows, I'd say 90% of the time that we spend is, is in actual business meetings with, with brands. And then at the occasional, the very rare and occasional meeting with, with an enthusiast or a client, that's a complete inverse for this period of time in New York, where 95% of the time is direct interaction with enthusiasts and fans and clients with maybe a happenstance conversation about business that happens along the way. So that would make this 
one of the few periods of time that truly, honest to God, really is focused on the end client and the consumer. And that is also, it, it cannot be overstated because I think I've said this before, but like, I do not advocate that people go to the, the public days at, at Watches and Wonders. It really is kind of, it's not, it's, it's not what you think it is. You know, it's really walking around. Speaking and, of being able to only look at watches behind glass. Yeah, it, that's literally yeah. what it is. And, and it's, not, and in fairness to the show organizers, the way that that show is set it's up. It's not geared that, to that. Yeah, it kind of has to be that way. But that's the exact opposite of the vibe at Watch Time or Wind Up, where you literally can just walk up to a booth. You can't do that at Watches and Wonders. You can pick up a watch. You definitely cannot do that at Watches and Wonders. And you might even be able to buy it, which you certainly cannot do at Watches and Wonders. Yeah, I think on, on a spectrum, it's kind of like you have Watches and Wonders on one far end. It's really geared toward the industry. And if you're an enthusiast, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go. Although you, I guess you if can you lived in, in Geneva, sure. Or if you have white glove treatment from a brand, if you're invited as a VIP for well, I'm, I'm not counting that because but, those people don't come to the public sure, days. But, but generally speaking, like it's really not geared to that. Then you have what happens in New York with watch time and wind up in particular where it's like very much open to the public and you can go hands on with watches. You will meet the people behind the brands and all that. In the middle, you have Geneva watch days, which I think is obviously much more collective, uh, collector friendly. But like we had experiences at Geneva watch days where we would walk into a brand's suite at the Beau Rivage Hotel, presumably because it is a collector geared event. And we were just ignored. Like there were brands where I walked into in, in to see them. Uh, one brand in particular, there were some watches I wanted to see just personally out of curiosity. And we walked in thinking, oh, it's Geneva watch days. We can walk into this hotel room and see stuff. And we were just completely ignored. So I do think the beauty of this time in New York is it is the most collector geared event. Now, it's interesting you re- you say that like someone really should step in. I think we're too far past that. It'd just be too too competitive. I think if you had a larger organization like a some sort of New York City trade organization or something like that who stepped in to do it, that would be okay. But I think a retailer or another media partner organizing a New York Watch Week is just a lot of fighting ready to happen. But I think it is worth pointing out there's a lot more than just watch time and wind up happening. Mm-hmm. I think we should chat about a couple of the things we did outside of watch time and wind up that were sort of these other sanctioned events. I think the most interesting one will be to chat about the GPHG event we went to at Watches of Switzerland. Yeah, so, so tell folks about that. So this is the first year that both Gabe and I are in the Academy for the GPHG. And for those of you who don't know, essentially what that means is there's an Academy of just about a thousand people who are responsible for nominating and voting for the winners of the GPHG awards. And then, of course, uh, from a within that group of about a thousand, thirty people then are selected to be part of the jury, and the jury has an outsized vote relative to the gen pop, if you will, of of the academy. But they had timed the GPHD, that is, uh, an event in New York where they had brought in all of the competing watches. Not all, but almost all. It, it was essentially yeah. all of the competing watches that were on display at Watches of Switzerland in Soho, which I think we've talked about before as being one of the more beautiful watch stores that that Gabe and I have had the pleasure of of being in. And it was a, it's, it's a great thing because the thing is a lot of these watches, especially for, for me, there's some of them, like I know very well, I've gone hands on with them. I know the makers. I, I, I have a very good idea of what I'm looking at. And then there are also some watches that you know, are are outside of what I generally pay attention to personally in the industry, like uh, some of those jewelry pieces, for example. The best table. So they have all the watches organized by theme at these sort of satellite tables upstairs and downstairs. And the best table was the table that had the ladies and the Mm -hmm. jewelry pieces Mm -hmm. on it. I mean, one, you're right. Where else are you and I going to see this stuff? You and I just don't cross paths with those watches on, on a daily basis. But two, oh my God, just the the level of watchmaking, of jewelry making and gem setting and just beauty and art at the, that was the best table at that. Yeah, some someday as a side note, um, we should we should do a deep dive on one of Gabe and my favorite places at Watches and Wonders, which is the Van Cleef and Arpels booth. Not for any business reason, but just to merely state that they are some of the most magnificent watchmakers on the planet, doing some of the most incredible work and get really not a whole lot of attention that is utterly due to them. Well, I think there's but, a whole episode on like the economics and the unique industry of jewelry watches, which I think would be fascinating. I don't know who buys this stuff and how the economics of it work. Yeah. So 
No, that, absolutely. There we but, go. But, but putting that aside, so this was the opportunity to go really hands on with those. And then in that room was a real rogues gallery of the watch industry, which I think was also quite telling about the scale and scope of this event. It wasn't just the U.S. teams. There was a lot of global CEOs and C-level executives from these watch brands that were there. And mixed into that were folks like us who are either Academy members or who are other dealers or distributors for these brands. A lot of media. A lot of media, absolutely. And then um, interestingly, a handful of who I have to imagine are quite significant Watches of Switzerland clients, which was also quite an amazing benefit, I suspect. And not just from that boutique. They were, I met watches of Switzerland clients from across the country who were, who oh, that's were clients of different ADs that watches of Switzerland had acquired, like mayors, for instance, sure. things like that, which I think was, was fascinating. Interesting people. Well, what I suspect is happening there is what, what used to happen, for example, with Patek Philippe and uh, Tiffany, where there were certain tentpole events where a handful of clients from each location would get flown out to something really special, either as a reward for their business or uh, in an attempt to develop them further or a mixture of both. And that was certainly at play there. And, and you can imagine the value prop of that is quite, is quite significant. Hey, come out, take a look at all these watches, some of which we retail, some of which we don't, but be able to meet all of these leaders here in an awesome space in a beautiful time of year in New York City. What I wonder about watch time and wind up in particular is... I, I think the, the brand opportunity, I think the marketing opportunity of, of these events is unquestionable. What I do wonder about is u- the ultimate revenue fallout from them. And it's a really interesting thing to explore because, you know, on the one hand, the best way to market, you know, any watch, I would argue, is not just to spend time talking about it, but to really spend time with it. And in that sense, events like this are an incredible opportunity for brands to really demonstrate what makes their watches so unique and so special and their watchmaking, you know, worthy of attention. But of course, we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't think that the number one reason that this is happening is because whether you're, you know, Brew or Grubel Forsey, you want to sell watches. And of course, there's because there is no unified entity that organizes it, there will be no, you know, uh, readout, so to speak, from the event as to how it performed financially. But I find this really an interesting thing, because the only reason people keep doing these events, brands, that is, is if they are able to have attributable revenue against it. And, you know... It will be very, I think it's always really interesting to see who comes back year over year, because that's a little bit of a silent notification of, of whether or not the event carried some degree of value, whether that was significant enough on the marketing side that it led to some degree of brand lift, or whether that was revenue driving in terms of actual sales that were attributable to the event. But I do wonder that, especially when I look at a fair like Windup, which has gotten to the point now where it's... um almost un- un- unimaginably large with, you know, I've heard numbers ranging from 140 to 160 different brands. 146 was the official count. Yeah. Unless you went table to table, Asher, with your own little uh, <laughs> counting device. I did not. But, but let, let, let's assume that's what it is, 146. That's extremely overwhelming for anyone from a client, you know, from a uh, collecting standpoint. And I have to wonder, and, you know, what the what the revenue implication was for a lot of client or a lot of brands that came out, because I think it, it can sometimes be lost when we think about events like this in, in the significant investment that every single human being who is standing behind a table has made to be there. There's the personal investment of being away from family and home. There's the non insignificant financial investment of paying for the physical space, building out that space, the expenses related to it, the import of watches, the, you know, depending on what kind of business you are, the cost of goods sold, we're talking about probably a collected cost of all of these events well, well, well into the the eight figures, you know? It's it's not insignificant for something like this to be put up. So I, I wonder as as we look at the the state of the current watch market, and I'm hopeful that this had significant opportunity and value that proved itself out during the event, but it's definitely something I'm curious to to think about and see as we talk to p- uh, brands through over the course of the next few years and next few episodes, for example, what value they extract from this. Well, I think it's it's not just a wind up thing. I think it is the New York Watch Week thing in general. No, but I There's, think wind up is a good example just because it was so much in in such a small space. Sure, sure, or, sure. Albeit a, a much bigger one than they used to be in. I think yes. And, and here's what I'm getting at: whether it's 
the brands at Windup, then add another, what, 30 brands from, from watch time, then add in competing events, whether it's the, the GPHG thing we talked about. We, what, we plus want, all the actual branded boutiques in the city. Plus, we, I walked into the Grand Seiko, the new Grand Seiko boutique. Awesome. By the way, the staff there are exceptional. They're just friendly and extremely well-informed. Great, great experience. They yeah, were discussing agree with that. among themselves like what they were doing to prepare. There are dinners that the brands host. We're a retailer. We hosted a dinner. We did a live podcast recording. We went to an awesome event that Oris hosts every year at a dive bar. Like, There's so much competing for your attention. And then, of course, Patek Philippe launches the Cubitus on top of all of this. There's just so much competing for your attention in those four days. We launched two limited editions. There's so much competing, whether it is the number of brands that wind up or all these other things I just yeah. mentioned. I wonder if at a certain point it actually inhibits discovery. Because if I see that all these projects are launching, there's new watches to check out, there's events to go do, there's over 100 brands at one of them, I start to say, okay, I need to manage my time. I need to think about what I want to see. In other words, I'm now not discovering new things. I'm going in to see the things that I've decided beforehand I want to see and shortlisting them. Whereas I remember my first windup, which was in San Francisco, which was not part of any San Francisco watch week. It was its own event. There was nothing else going on. And there were maybe 20 or 30 brands. I had the time to go to every single brand's table, meet the people, look at the watches and discover new things I had never seen before. And so I start to wonder if all the competition around an event in a watch week like this actually starts to do the opposite which is discourage discovery of new things and reinforce the things that people are already looking for. So I would argue that this is the exact reason that a organizing entity would provide value, especially if it's a media company. If media is doing what it's supposed to do, it would be able to metabolize all of this information and be able to say for the enthusiast of X, Y, or Z, here's where you should go. Or, you know, if you are a fan of, you know, brand A, Perhaps you should take some time to meet Brand Y, which has flown in from wherever it is that they're from, and this is your opportunity to see them. So I think that that there's th this is my point. Like this is such a young and nascent phenomenon relative to what existed before that the opportunity is is, is quite significant. These aren't criticisms; these are opportunities. And I think no, it's it's remarkable that one of the world's largest watch events is entirely grassroots yeah and as a result there's a you know there's like an organized organized chaos going on yeah that's it's definitely chaotic or maybe at this point um, it's a disorganized chaos yeah, exactly. and we need a little bit more organization so all of that to say for those of you who ever have thought about going we can't we can't recommend it more highly as a period of time to be in new york and it's not just for one type of collector you know, the, the Casio G-Shock collectors will find in, as much in excitement, enjoyment. In, in fact, literally this year, if you were a Casio and G-Shock collector, there was a lot for oh you to see. Oh my gosh. They had an um, incredible exhibit on 50 years of Casio watches at, exactly. uh, at Windup. It was cool. They had some remarkable, sort of, I guess, museum pieces is what they would be. Totally. And then you could go right back uptown and check out the first calculator watch. Actually, not even uptown anymore. Excuse me. You could just go two blocks over and check out um, the new releases from Elysian Ardan, from Chapek, from Grubel 4C, from Zeitwinkel, all the above. Which I think is a perfect segue into what we're about to turn on, which is the live recording that was done live on the Saturday of Wind Up, featuring myself Zach Kazan from Worn and Wound, and two phenomenal business owners in the watch world, Martin Fry of Urwork. He's the creative director and co-founder of Urwork, and Jonathan Ferrer, who is the creative director and, and, and founder of the Brew Watch Company. And th this is something that I've always wanted to do, which is a live recording of our pod. This is the theater student in me, I guess, coming out. Can, but, I, can I confess something? Please. I hate live recordings of podcasts as, a, as, as attending a, listening to them. So as, as a deep consumer of podcast content, I always cringe and shudder when my favorite podcasts do a live episode. <laughs> and, and the reason why is like, you know, 
a lot of the, the podcasts you love, and maybe this is one of them, you know, there's, there's a rhythm and a format to it and a comfort to it you come to, to grow and love. And then when they do these live podcast recordings, I think one of the things I struggle with in listening to it is it feels like the people in the audience at the live recording and the fact that it is a live recording, it sort of overtakes the whole thing. And it feels like you're an outsider listening in on, on this like event that you weren't a part of. And then also like, because usually these things are done like ours, like in a room with a stage and all this, like the hosts and the the guests are like shouting into the microphones and like all, all it just, it sort of breaks the wall of what I love about, about podcasts. So Great but, setup for our live you know, recording. I think Gabe. this is. I think it's an important. <laughs> I think it's an important setup to say like we've tried to and and if you listen to the way we edited and mixed this live recording, we tried to do it in a way that was very conscious of the fact that most of you folks are listening to it, and so it's going to sound hopefully a lot like an episode of Open Work would sound if we were sitting here around the table at the collective office with our guests. A lot of the things that I think are shortcomings of live podcast recording, we've tried to handle in the editing, the presentation, and the mixing of the podcast. So we we hope you enjoy it. And why don't we roll it now? Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is the first live recording of Open Work and Ward and Wound combining, joining forces together in podcast form. Asher, thank you for for being here. Thank you so much for having us. So I am Asher Rapkin, co-founder of Collective Horology. And I'm Zach Kazan. I'm the managing editor at Warn and Wound. So for those who are not familiar, Open Work is a podcast looking at the inner workings of the watch industry. And of course, Warn and Wound is a podcast looking at the culture and the daily happenings in the watch industry. So we're going to try and explore a couple of topics from both of those perspectives today. Before we do, I'd love to have our guests just introduce themselves for those who don't know them, and then we'll dive right in. I'm Martin Fry, the chief designer, founder, co-founder, and co-owner of uh, Urwerk. And my name is Jonathan Ferrer. I'm the designer and founder of Brew Watch Company here, local in New York. Both of you come from very different places, from a design standpoint, literally in the world. However, I would argue both Brew and Urwerk are design-driven brands at their core. I'd love to talk just a little bit about the intersection between brand development, so what it means to actually project what you are thinking about and what your brand means to the external world, and design, and how you think about how those two things connect with one another. Because not every brand perfectly aligns between how their product comes to life and how they communicate what they view as their value to their market. So, Jonathan, I'd love to start with you. When you were when you were starting brew or even just now as you are deep in it how do you think about how design and brand intersect this is such a deep question so thanks asher this is something before i even hit the sketchbook was a big concept that i had to take into play because i didn't want to just have another race car watch i didn't want to have another space watch i wanted to have my own vision my own voice within the watch industry because it's such a vast industry. So I literally asked myself, what is something that I can relate to and connect with and believe others would also feel the same way? And I said, oh, well, every person, a lot of people enjoy their time over coffee when they're they're out after work with friends, dates, meetings. I'm like, it's kind of like this intersection between the day-to-day lives of so many people. So I said, all right, that would be an experience that I'd like to tie into. All right, concept one. And then, of course, when it comes to the design, what are relevant timing periods that I'd like to tether into? And what I'm really saying here is every part of the design, every part of the brand has narrative, has reasoning, and has meaning, rather than just another stamped out round watch that exists in this vast industry, which gets lost. And when I wanted to start this, I wanted to come out with a bang. I wanted to be bold, but not just for the sake of being different, but with reason and something that I could, of course, connect to and be able to share myself. What I'm hearing you say, and I think this this is where I'd love to turn to you, Martin. Jonathan's talking about how brand is fall, essentially is falling out of product, if, if, I'm, if I'm getting that accurate. So what you defined and what you created is now giving way to how the brand is articulated and how it comes to life, whether it's through the marketing, whether it's through media, whether it's through the shorts that you do on YouTube, TikTok, et cetera. 
in the context of Urwerk, where design language, is, the design language has been from 1997 on, I think, very, very, very clear in its vision. How has that particular, how has your design language impacted the way that Urwerk as a brand introduces itself to new clients? Well, I would say that, of course, these two things, the, the watchmaking and also the design, those are both engineering you know, disciplines. You know, it's not that much of a difference. You have different functions. You have the inner functions of the movement and you have the, the functions that, you know, communicate or that protect what's inside. And so I see these two things not that much, you know, different. They are very much interlinked. And for us, of course, from the very beginning on and how we started is actually with the different time indication. Different time indication somehow informed my design. So, but I realized <clears throat> that when, when we work with this different time indication that was suggested by the watchmakers, that <clears throat> that enables me to do to do the watch differently, to create a different watch. So but that somehow began kind of like a an interplay, like a back and forth, a ping pong game between, you know, the, the engineers and or let's say the mechanical engineers, the watchmaking engineers and the the design engineer, you know? So this is, you know, this game that we are playing. It's very much like woven into each other, you know, these two parts, so these two sides of it. I wanna I wanted to ask you, Martin, about you know, starting the brand in the late 90s and the early 2000s, obviously the watch media landscape is very different than than it than it is now. We have, I think, a pretty mature watch media at this point. I'd like to think there's a lot of different, you know, websites covering the watch industry in different ways. What were some of the challenges in kind of like bringing your vision to like to the larger, you know, la larger public of watch consumers in that early period? I mean, how has it changed? And Jonathan, I'd be curious you know, how it's changed for you starting the brand, starting your brand, you know, so much later in comparison in a much more mature media landscape. For us, the chance was, of course, that we were invited to be part of the Independent Watchmaking Academy. And Felix was, you know, working for Sven Andersen at some point. And he, it was the big, you know, person for that uh, Independent Watchmaking Academy. They had a booth or a stand at Basel Fair. And so we had the chance to to exhibit our our first watches. There were three watches at the very beginning, right? So, and we presented them on a, a heating plate just to show something hot. And everybody was like, what are they doing? You know, what is this? It's unusual. But, you know, that's it. So we had the chance to show it there. And, and Basel World, of course, was kind of, it's, and it's, it's in a way, it's a pity that it doesn't exist anymore. We don't need it as much anymore as we used to. But it was really kind of a moment, kind of like a ritual that somehow, you know, had things striving. You know, it's happened every year and we had to go to this ritual. It demanded us to do an exhibit our watches. So, you know, both ways. But yeah, so it, it was very different. The whole industry met at that big fair. It was kind of also extremely tiring and annoying. But on the other hand, you know, everybody was there, you know, so the, the industry got a feeling for itself. And especially later during COVID times now, I I understood that it's something very important that that one meets, you know, in person, and that one has the time to to somehow see what is this industry that you're, you know, a part of. Uh, but for you, Jonathan, in 2015, when you're launching your brand, how are you getting people to notice your brand? What's your strategy? Well, I was just thinking about this actually when I was in school 14 plus years ago. I actually had an artwork on my wallpaper in school. So even before I was in the industry, I set myself up. For this exact moment, to so be you literally had a pinup of Martin. You manifested your, this. I did manifest moment, this. Yeah, yeah I yeah. like that. <laughs> it was amazing. It was the case back, the turbines. It was yeah. that was my wallpaper. So I, I planted myself here over fourteen years ago. <laughs> yeah. So how did it change from 2015 till today? Yeah. How how did you in 2015 you're starting your brand? How do you set about like getting people to notice your brand? Are you taking a like proactive approach with media at that yeah, it's point? A, is it more of like a bootstraps kind of grassroots thing? What's was, your strategy? It's a mix of everything. So I would go to Ball's World. I would go to the press lounge and tuck my flyers in the, the, the magazine section, even though you're not supposed to. I would do everything bootstrapping to get my name out there. Of course, that wouldn't work, but you know, you meet people along the way. Two things that really changed over the course of a decade for me was my marketing refined as much as my product did. So 
when you look at, let's just say, a graph of my brand over the past 10 years, you'll see the audience grow and the, the brand grow, however you measure those metrics. And that growth, I would affiliate with my watches getting more refined. So the design, the way they feel, the way that they're received, but also my marketing. So I realized my, it, it takes time to realize your narrative and how it gets shared with others. When I first started, I said, oh, I have to look and appear as a, a, I'm this big brand for people to take me serious. And it wasn't until like five, six years in that I realized my greatest asset was just being myself and sharing the most honest and transparent story of, oh, this is just a young guy, has a great idea, a great concept. And that story resonated with people. People wanted to dig deeper. They said, oh, have you always been interested in design? And so the very honest, authentic story for me and the brand was the one that people engaged with best. So comparing early years, which is just cold object photos, to today where it's full narrative videos on what's a day in the life like? What are you designing? So the transparency in the story has come through. Was there a moment when you realized that that, like when that transition happened, when it became more... I don't know if I call it like personality driven, but like you appear now in in so many of your social media clips and you're like truly the face of the brand. You're the head of customer service. I am. But you know, so, I'm yeah. so comfortable now because when I first started, everybody told me and everybody was wrong. They said, don't show your face. You're going to corner yourself. Everybody said, seem as though you're bigger. We, the team, us. And then the truth was, it was one guy, again, doing all these different parts. And I said, why not expose that? And people realized that it was a real journey. Can you talk a little bit about what that specifically that process was like doing it like by yourself for the first couple sure. of years, at, at least? Like, because you really did. I mean, you're mailing packages. Yeah, yeah. Paper. I'll give you a quick nutshell because it, it, it's a lot. So everything from like design sketches, Adobe Illustrator, 3D, 3D printing, engineering the drawings, working with multitude of manufacturers for, for prototyping. You get it. Photography, marketing, website, analytics, trade shows, running to these lounges and slipping your flyers in and, you know, finding people that can assist along the way, such as Warren and Wound and people that would gravitate towards my vision, you know, down to quality controlling the watches, servicing the watches, boxing them up, you know, taking returns and sending, you name it, that multitude of processes I was managing. Of course, you know, 10 years later, I'm trying to alleviate some with help, but it was, it was a lot. I want to, I want to look at two, two things, which I find really interesting because when you start talking about the way the brand was introduced and I think, and, and you talk about, I mean, correct me if I'm characterizing this incorrectly, but there was a little bit of, a, of, of luck and there were a lot of luck and then some stunt, right? Like, oh, we're going to put it on a hot plate. We're going to see what happens. We're going to do anything we can to get somebody to, to pay attention. And, and that, am I characterizing that accurately? No, absolutely. That's, that's exactly how it was. You know, you, it depends on, you know, what's on, on what your plan is when you start. You so know, that, if you have the, this clear idea, I want to become a watch brand, you know, and want to become this and that, it's very different from how we started. You know, well, this is what I this is what I'm curious about because this this form of attention economy has evolved dramatically in the last in the 20 year span between your two brands. So in this case, you're competing for the attention of a, of a select few who hopefully will amplify that story to people that might become passionate about collecting over. It was still the old fashioned way, I'd say, without the internet. You know that much yet. That was really something that that was different. That also helped us. And in 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 uh, due time, you know, it of course is extremely important also for us and for the way we got to know. But at the very beginning, it wasn't that. It was really like the circle of watch people, you know, coming to a watch fair, looking at something, and you know, then word by word, you know, so to say, or mouth to mouth, you know, it's it's somehow the message spread. Like that. Uh, so this so is this it took is, a while. It took a moment, you know. For, for so you guys that. almost had opposite approaches into a similar point, which is to say, you guys started by speaking to not only press hoping to amplify, but also a core group of collectors that might have gotten really excited and and might become hopefully the ambassadors of your brand to other folks and 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 grow it on on a you know slower basis. What really helped, really quick, maybe too, was of course that the Revolution magazine 
was just created around the same time. And so we had also, and that was also kind of old fashioned because it was a magazine, you know, it was, a, uh, but, but they, they, you know, as the, the name revolution says, they were also interested in doing it differently, you know, in advertising watches differently. So, so it way ago, you know, we had, a, we had a really a person who, who was happy to, to, to see some cool new stuff to, to somehow have it in his magazine and that that helped us a lot but of course it, it, it is also the, the the fact that we did the opus 5 project that then you know it was shining a bit of a light you know onto our creation of 103 so we had that watch ready but that gave us a bit more you know yeah, you know, it's, in, it's interesting for those who for those who don't know like the opus series was a, a project through Harry Winston and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was at that time managed by Max Booster, yes? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, uh, sort of nascent idea of, of partnership leading to broadening an audience, which in that which is interesting because, of course, I suspect a lot of people who were looking at Harry Winston watches probably weren't thinking about Urworks. So giving them that opportunity to explore it was fascinating. Jonathan, I'm curious, you were born into a digital era where, in, where the, you know, the, the attention economy, if you will, is very different. And you had access to mass media at a much more affordable rate that you could control in a way that wasn't available in 1997. So it, you, you're you sort of starting not only literally 20 years later, but also at a very different point. However, your competition is like ridiculous. There's significantly more brands. There's so much so much stuff competing for attention in the world. You know, there's 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 tech companies that are out there that are, you know, screaming for your money to try and get you to support them. So even though you had access to every eyeball in the world, you talked a little bit about how you just evolved your design or how you communicated from, you know, cold product shots into trying to express from yourself. So I'm just curious, what were the lessons that you learned along the way there from a from a marketing standpoint about what was effective with people when you're competing with everybody as opposed to trying to capture the attention of a select few who will then become your advocates? Great question, Asher. Well, first, I could start with, I shouldn't have survived this long because it is <laughs> such a massive industry. And there's just, at my price point, countless watches out there, countless brands. There's a new one born every minute, right? So how do you stand out? I would say there's two definite things that were in my favor that I did. I did one thing, which was going to a lot of these events, whether it was Red Bar or other events in the city. And what I would say that is for me is a trickle down effect. So if I was able to please these folks that have the Airworks, the MBNFs, the Paddocks, whatever you name it, the trickle down effect for me, which was if I could appease these people with my product, that would trickle down to the masses in a way where if this person's spending six figures on that watch and they're happy, and on the other side, there's a brew watch for four or $500, and it gives that same emotional reaction. They're triggered in a positive way, and they have kind things to say about it. Well, that, that tier will trickle down to the masses over time. So that was one thing that was in my favor. The second, of course, was digital media. And thing that was in my favor, which was I was the demographic I was marketing to. So I had that short attention span myself. I knew from flipping through social media what worked, what didn't. And so I kind of knew how to steer that course on how to grab people's attention and keep it. And of course, you know, funnel my, my story through. But I would say it's difficult. Like, now I search for my brand. I see all these other brands are bidding on my name. I'm like, look at these guys. This is like, you know, brand with an F in front of it. And I'm like, that's like the, a huge conglomerate and they're bidding on my name. It's like, how do you compete with the the lords of the industry? But I would say the underdog has such an opportunity now more than ever in the past to stand out and thrive in this industry. Do you still think of yourself as an underdog at this point? Yeah. So when people come in here, ah, oh, brew on, and then they name every single version I've ever done, like, that I can sleep happy. Literally, I'll go to sleep with a smile on my face. When you go outside, nobody knows or cares. I would assume who brew is. But, you know, funny enough, they go in the city sometimes and they're like, oh, is that a brew on your wrist? And then they look up like, Jonathan? I have no idea who these people are. And you're also, happening. you're on billboards. Well, I did that for fun. But <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest, billboards don't actually matter. Because, you know, back to the digital era that we're in, like, you look at a billboard, you forget it. You're, 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 you should be driving. So... Everything is on your phone. You know, people are on their phone more than they're driving while they're driving, which is unfortunate. Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do not run ads while people are driving. No, 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 no. <laughs> but now we come to the modern day. We're both Urberg 
and brew and the brands that are in your cohorts are now you're on equal footing. Now you're now you're a digital brand. You're a digital brand, even if you guys were born in different eras. So now in, in some ways, even if you're coming from different places, you're competing on the same grounds and you're competing not only for obviously clients and they're really you're competing for their attention just to be able to share, at least in my opinion, what makes you special. I mean, we talked a moment ago about what it means to have design fundamentally define your brand. We talked about how that comes out to get people's attention and how that was different in your eras. But now you're on the same page. And what I find interesting, and like I think about, like when I think about Urwork, for example, is some of the ways for which you command attention through product. So for example, uh, for Only Watch, the the clock that you created the space time blade yes the space time blade i remember looking at this in the context of the catalog and i started laughing because it was you know a hundred incredible watches and then urwork made a lightsaber you know and it was just like the way that you decided to have the product fundamentally command the attention was so clear and i just i'm curious is that is that intentional like do you think do you think about that like the context of what you're making or the context of where something will be seen or were you going to just make you know the space time blade anyway and it just happened to to you know fall into to that particular collection i mean one one let's say for us one good thing is that we are really a small brand actually you know it's 20 people and you know we have uh, quite exclusive. Obviously, we have not. We don't produce that many watches. So in a way, advertising we we we, can, we should not do too much. You know, in a way, not too much advertising. You know, we don't need to have a lot of people. It's great if a lot of people like it, but we don't really need to look for it. You know, are you, are you being coy though, or are you really not, or do you really not think about how the product sits when it's sitting? No, across? okay, of course, we just like to make cool stuff, you know. Sure. And we, we, when we have a thing like the the only watch, we want to show something special, you know. That's clear, something different. That's maybe since the very beginning, our path, you know, to it differently. It's not the only path, obviously, but you know, not that many do do it, and so. That's actually what we do, what we like to do, you know, surprise people maybe with something, but then again. Oh, oh you surprised me. <laughs> with that, but then also have this kind of, uh, you know, like evolutionary process. Yeah. Where you somehow you, you can maybe imagine how a future will work will look, but it will look a bit different and it still will look, look cool. That's, uh, of course, important. So there could be more lightsabers is what you're saying at, at some point. <laughs> Well, what we really like, and that's from the beginning on, we have uh, our our time indication is is inspired by a table clock from right. you know 1650 around. The Campanus brothers they created this clock, you know, that's in the Renaissance times, and this special time indication is of course very important to us, and it, it gave us somehow from the beginning on, it gave us this direction to do it differently. It's like a different time indicator. We have so much. You know, so deep inside of us, we have this kind of pictogram-like, you know, time image of the watch with hands. That's somehow how we imagine time, right? That's how it looks. And if you do it a bit differently, that is with this different time indication where the, the hours indicate the minutes as we do it, you you somehow are puzzled when you see it first. And that's kind of an advertising already. Well, you're also, you're also talking about how the way that you design transcends form factor which is really, really interesting to me that the design language that you have, if you think about the way like most people approach only watch, which obviously is an ch incredible charitable thing, but it's also, it's, it's a showcase. It's, it's a huge marketing opportunity. The way you approached it, you, you know, most people do. If it works. <laughs> if it's just a different podcast topic, but the way that you were approaching it was to say, I'm going to look at, I'm, I'm going to have her work represented and the, and the product and the brand represented through a core design language rather than the way that a lot of other people approached it, which is to say, I'm going to make a variation of an existing watch that fits into the theme. You went several layers back. So I'm curious, Jonathan, when you think about design and product in the content, and, and this is a good example upstairs. I mean, there's a hundred and how many brands are here? This 140 plus. Okay. Brands. So, wow. So 140 brands up there as people walk by and 
there's incredible, amazing things to see, but it can be overwhelming. What do you think defines your brand through the product that you have up there? Because it's in, in, to a certain degree, it's not too dissimilar from Only Watch. Hundred and some odd lots, lots of attention being pulled. How do you command attention and how does your design language affect that upstairs? Very simple. At the base level, it's the silhouette of the watch. When you, We would always play these games when we were designing watches. We would design it on the computer, we would print it out, and then one of us would sharpie out the silhouette. And then we'd hold it up and say, hey, can you tell me what brand is this? And no, it was just another round watch. You take an Erverk. Oh, my gosh. You know it, it's an Erverk. Like it, you could tell by the silhouette. So silhouette is always a good strength card for recognizability as your DNA. Of course, our colorways, our silhouettes, the brand and, and the faces, those are huge. But, you know, tethering back to what you were talking about before, I think it's important to have these, I would call them hero products, something that shows your capabilities, your your flex points, so to speak, right? Like this only watch that you're mentioning, how do you stand out from the rest of the crowd? I think every once in a while, it, it's important to flex, to just show your capability. And this is, you know, we're extending the topic a little bit here. And something I'm thinking about now that is opening my eyes. It doesn't even matter if it's a revenue driver. Hopefully you don't lose too much money. But like I'm playing now with more experimental concepts of materials, the way you tell time. It's it's no overwork by any means. But the idea of, you know, showing your capability as a brand over an extended period of time is super important. Otherwise you get lost. Again, people see, they recognize, and that's good for a short period of time. But I think the longevity of the brand is showing your capabilities and your vision, whether it's an only watch or here and there as as you progress. I'd love to just talk a little bit, and this is this is the business guy in me, about how two independent brands approached some, and, and I don't want to make assumptions, but speaking as a small business owner, I've been there, so I suspect all of us have at one point, gotten to a point where some some element of pressure has come in. You're running out of money. You are maybe the sales aren't where you want. Something isn't happening the way you want to. And you have those those moments where you look at yourself and you start to question. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that. Okay, I'm right to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, because you guys have spent the last the last forty minutes talking about your dedication and your belief in what you're doing and how you're doing it. What did you do or what have you done in those moments when it's not working and some external pressure is telling you this may never work? What do you do to keep going? You know, this first six years were really pretty hard. Well, we were used to listen to a single of the Rolling Stones, you know, time is <laughs> on your side. We were just pretty naive, you know, starting. Just beginning doing stuff and then you insist and it was at least six years at the beginning, where we didn't earn anything with it, you know, basically, <laughs> and we had to sort of invest, and nobody knew us, you know, that's the way it is. So, so if you enjoy what you're doing, and then slowly but surely, you know, after a couple of years, it started to become more important. And so that's actually how we started. It's from that moment, that kind of mood that we started. So six years, you know, we had to somehow find out how to do it. And that somehow, it, it never got worse than that, you know. How about you, Jonathan? You've talked about kind of like underestimating the financial like needs of kind of like running a watch brand in the early going. What was that? What were those moments like for you? And what kind of like levers did you pull to uh, get things on the on the right track? My benefit was I was young and I started with no money, and so over the time I respected money and I learned how to use it as a tool. But I still to this day don't care about money. So I pretend money's not real. It's just a tool to get to the next level, right? So it's just credits for me to make the next watch, the next materials, the next flight to X country to share the vision. And so the less I treat money like money and the more I treat it like credits, like a tool, I failed and succeeded so heavily. Now I would say I have a pretty good template on what I need at this point. It's like 10 years deep, right? But you're never stable. And I would conclude with I pretend every launch, every product, everything that I do is the last time. So how would I do it if it was really the last time? Oh. And that little bit of a thought makes me put 110% into that step. Yeah, it's interesting. Gabe and I have talked about this in the past. And for us, when we started doing this, we were very optimistic and we were very lucky. I mean, I often talk about the fact that I don't know that I would have had the balls to ask you to work with us 
now <laughs> versus when we did five years ago, because there's a certain power in ignorance and naivete. But what that also led to was this belief that only ever asking yourself, what's going to happen when something works? You know, so if you evaluate a project and you say, if this works, the outcome will be however many credits or the outcome will be, you know, the ability to, to, to gain more attention or what have you. But I never asked myself. And, and in fact, this is something I've, I've heard from a lot of other colleagues in the industry. Well, what happens if this is an abject and utter failure? And it's a question that I think a lot of creative people don't like to ask because, of course, nobody gets started to fail. But it's such a critical component of the journey of, of building a brand or something. And then it brings up this really fascinating rhetorical question, which is if you ask yourself, here, what will happen if it's super successful? Well, we all know what that outcome looks like. But if you ask yourself, what will happen if it's an utter and abject, miserable failure? What then? Because the other, you know, one answer to that is, well, I'll just stop. But of course, none of us, exactly, <laughs> none of us want to do that. So if, if we look just for a moment there, at, at the lowest point for both of you, what made you continue to the next step? It was in the year four or five where my greatest failure was my greatest success. Hmm. Terrible, terrible times with manufacturers. It was all going downhill. Product was at an all-time low. It was terrible. I wasn't sending anything out, and I was just losing. At the time, it, I thought it was a lot. It was just hundreds of thousands of dollars down the drain. So for a young guy at that stage, that was a lot. And it was crippling to the point where even my family says, you should, you know, close up shop and get a job. And I remember sending fake interview resumes to Fossil. I didn't want to work for Fossil, but I, to appease my parents. But the, the, the silver lining was I was forced into a corner. You'll hear this from every entrepreneur. Your, your greatest failures are usually where you succeed. I stopped and I thought super calm and I reached out to a few folks and I found till this day, my greatest manufacturing partners who are like my family have taken care of me and we've been doing amazing work together just because I failed so hard in the past. I think this, it's again the, the engineer mindset, you know, that helps in a situation like this. So engineers, as I got to know them and as I'm myself, you know, you when, when, when something goes wrong, when something doesn't work exactly the way you imagine it or the way you maybe planned it or thought it would happen, when there's a problem coming up, then, you know, get creative. That's exactly the point. So, so you try to solve the problem and make something good out of it. And that's, that's the, the way to do it, of course. And also the other idea, what you said, actually, that if, if money is not the main thing, if, if you're concentrating on doing your thing, creating something and, and, and making it, and if that's also your, what you get out of it, the pleasure that you get out of it, but if, if money is not the, the, somehow the driving thing behind it, then that's the way to do it. You will find a way to solve the problem and you will enjoy that, you know, solving the problem. But that's the way to look at it, you know, to, to, to try to enjoy that. And the engineer shows you how to do it. That's, that's the mindset of the watchmaker. We can probably close it out by bringing it back to the, like to the collector community. This is this is wind up. This is a big watch collector of event, you know, at its core. So, to close it out, how do each of you stay in in close contact with your collector communities? I think each of you have obviously like very dedicated core bases of collectors who've supported you from the very beginning and continue to to support you. What is your what's your strategy for uh, for remaining close to those? communities today martin if you want to take that first yeah no of course that's extremely important and then you know especially during covid times you realized how difficult it can be when you can't meet people in person so if you have i mean even though we did our project on the screen mm -hmm. like in the you know covid times the our covid project uh, it still works you know one can do it but it's not so easy i mean we have met quite a long time after you know we did our project and so that's something that 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 is of course extremely important to see people in person to meet them what we do we organize our dinners you know we travel and we go to events like like this or like the one that we Gotham Hall you know like so we we, we just meet people i find it super in, exciting to show the watches you know that it's also partly why we do it because we want to get some some echo you know people like saying i like it but also maybe pe people criticizing it and say well i would have done it maybe differently so you, you can learn from it but it's not that that you then after that shape your new plan 
after you know the, the somehow the demands of 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 people but you, but you 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 see how you know how the how the people react on it how the your your friends and fans maybe you know how they react on it so it's it's really the interaction you need to see people in 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 in, in real and show the watches that they can touch it you know wear it and like it hopefully naturally social media i'm, I'm there and you know, i've talked to some people that have millions of followers and i would ask them i say how do you manage all these these DMs, messages, and comments all the time? And they would say, I, I do it myself. I said, you don't have a company? I said, no, I do it. And that's one thing I never removed myself from because I never wanted to have a, a wall between me and the end consumer, in this case, fans and audience members. So I still do my best to, to answer everybody on social, email, and go as far as to even give my phone number out. Even though my partner, she says, don't. I give out my phone number and you know I'll take phone calls and texts. But I think most importantly, and fortunately, being in New York City, going to different events, touching base physically, seeing people is like a huge, huge benefit for, for me. Yeah, even in the age of the internet, I think it, there's really no substitute for like getting out there and like being at a watch event. There's something special about that. I prefer to just comment on watch articles. Yeah. Is that you, the keyboard warrior, just commenting? Mm, yeah. Indeed. I knew it was. Martin Fried, Jonathan Fair, thank you so much for, for joining us. Asher, first live podcast. Congratulations. This is a big step. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for listening. Open Work is a production of Collective Horology. You can learn more about our guests, Martin Fry and Jonathan Ferrer, at erwork.com and brew-watches.com, respectively. And of course, you can find Zach Kazan and the Worn and Wound podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to the Worn and Wound team for producing and hosting the live recording, and of course, the Wind Up Watch Fair. You can find us at collectivehorology.com, and to get in touch with your suggestions, feedback, or questions, just email podcast at collectivehorology.com.